And we've got Jennifer Madrill, who's the founder of Designers for Learning, which is a nonprofit in the US that facilitates service based opportunities uh, to support underserved educational needs. Uh, she completed her PhD in the Instructional Design and Technology Program at Old Dominion University, where she was awarded a dissertation fellowship to complete um, this research and served as an adjunct assistant professor. Um, and John is uh, John Barkey is from Old Dominion University, where he is an assistant professor in the College of Education. Um, and he completed his PhD in instructional design at Wayne State University and then served as a volunteer with um, Designers for Learning since 2015 um, as a course designer and facilitator. So today they're going to be evaluating and revising OERs, in particular how they're going to help us think about questions such as how can OER be designed, adapted, and shared to be useful with a wide range of learners and contexts? How can OER be easier to find and OER programs be financially self-sustaining? And how can we design, evaluate, rank, and document OER quality? Um, yeah, so thank you very much. We look forward to your presentation today, Jen and John. Um, over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much for having us today. And Nicola, I was so fortunate to meet you in the hallways of a conference last fall um, for the Association of Educational Communication and Technology. And I believe that was the official partnership between that organization, AECT, and Emerge Africa. And so I think this is a really, um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for us to continue the conversation we had in the hallway in our session today. Um, and I just is a moment, um, take a moment just to talk about how John and I work. We're very informal people. Um, we definitely both love um, participation in the text chat. And if you'd like to interject and ask questions, please do so at any time. And I'll call on uh, Tony and, and Nicola to help us um, in case we don't see any of the questions or comments coming through on the text chat back channel. But um, as I said, we're, we're very informal and we do have certain slides and things we'd like to, to have a chance to talk about. But um, if, if something else comes up that we'd, we'd like to, to discuss, please interrupt us. Here's what our faces look like. Um, I'm on the right. Uh, my name is, again, Jennifer Madrill. And John, do you want to just say hello? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and good morning to those in the States. So he does exist. He's actually here with us today. Um, and again, John will be just interjecting as well as, as we go through. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about who we are, because I, as we talked about in the, before we turned the recording on about 10 minutes ago or so, we have a lot of similarity with Emerge Africa in terms of how we began and what uh, we hope to become when we grow up. Uh, we started as a nonprofit, uh, which is an NGO in the United States in 2014. But before that, we were all faculty, those of us who founded the organization, and we were looking for ways for our students in our graduate instructional designs to have opportunities to apply um, the instructional design techniques that they were learning in, in the classroom in the real world. And so we would use an, a, an approach, an educational approach that we term here in the United States called service learning. And I believe from what Nicholas said, it may have a little bit different um, definition and, and terminology in different parts of the world. And I'll just explain in a moment what we mean by service learning. But our organization, our mission is to provide service learning opportunities to instructional design st students to learn their craft. And we do this for the benefit of underserved uh, populations and underserved needs. And so we'll, we'll drill down on that in a moment, specifically. The, the underserved needs that we target in our in our projects. So, in terms of service learning, what we're talking about is a combination that are laid out in this exhibit here. Pi. 
The first being the academic course. So in our case, it's instructional design coursework. Um, there's the piece of includes work-based applied learning, so experience learning opportunities. But the piece of the pie that is unique to service learning is this idea of community service. So that the work that the students based applied learning opportunities is geared toward, in some way, in some fashion, benefiting a community. Uh, and we'll talk again in a moment about the community that we're focusing on. And so our targeted serve, underserved needs that we've been working on for the past is adult basic education. And again, this requires a little bit of um, explanation in terminology because it is a, uh, this concept is uh, has term terminology across the, the globe, but in a nutshell, in a in a in a uh, quick concise definition, we really are targeting the uh, seven basic literacy skills, so literacy and math skills. Um, that would be um, uh, in, in the United States the equivalent of someone. Who completed high school uh, very often. They've dropped out of education uh, before years old. And so that's really the, the targeted underserved that we're focusing on in our experiences. And the way we conduct our projects, they're all 100% virtual. Um, for the past 18 months, we've focused on service learning MOOCs. And before we jump too far ahead in talking about a MOOC, I've, I often assume everyone in age knows what this is. Um, but it's basically a massive open online course. And um, I just had a quick question on uh, the text chat. How many of you have participated in a MOOC or maybe facilitated a MOOC? If you could just put your response in the text chat, because it will help John and I as we have a better understanding of or possibly hosted MOOC. Okay, so Ahmed, you've participated in one. That's great. And Abby, that's good. That's great. And I, I, I just throw that in now because I've made the assumption too many times what a MOOC is and the group is, is well versed on, on what MOOCs are. That's great. If you'd like to know more about our MOOC, um, I'll have the next few slides to how you can find us and actually how you can participate with us. We have our MOOC starting on March 20th, and it runs for six. a platform called Canvas Network. I'm assuming some of you, as long as we have a lot of folks here that are in higher education, are familiar with Canvas. It is a learning management system that's very popular here in the United States, and there is um, short time they've been around. I believe they've only really been around in the shorter part of the last um, and they've really taken higher education by storm. And they have carved out a niche for MOOCs. They're free and they're available for not um, and other universities to be able to host large scale online courses. And we we're now going to have our third iteration of our MOOC starting in March. So if you head over to Canvas Network poke around, you'll be able to find our MOOC with the title is listed here. It's the Instructional Evaluation Service. We have um, 
specific links. Uh, and Nick, thank you very much. She put a link in the text chat out about our, our MOOC and where you can find it. There's the picture then of what we look like. So if you look on the page, that's what the, the, the catalog, that's what our, our page looks like. So let's just drill down a little bit and talk about what the focus is. Getting back to the, as, as we were built here, this is a conversation about open educational resources, and I've yet to say that term, so had to have quite a long preamble to, to get to this point. But our project-based course um, is set up for students who join, who join the MOOC, will gain instructional design experience while they're evaluating and redesigning open educational resources. And the open educational resources they're creating are for the benefit of adult basic education programs. So to give you an example, it may be a lesson on um, somehow bringing in uh, teaching about fractions, but embedding it within a context that would be relevant to an adult as they're attempting to find a better job or maybe trying to pursue, uh, finish their high school um, credentials to be able to go on to college. And so the types of um, lessons that are built by the participants in our MOOC. Then is to succeed, hopefully succeed, in bringing together two groups with overlapping needs. We have adult basic education programs in need of resources, and in particular free resources. It, uh, the open educational resources uh, or the, the resources for free, and then we have the group of instructional design students who are looking to gain experience in instruction. And so by bringing them uh, these needs together within our MOOC, hopefully those are the two, two that we're serving within our, within our projects. And just to give you a snapshot, um, and I think this might be a group, given uh, most of you here are in higher education, most of the participants who join our MOOC already have their master's degree. Um, and so they're either um, completing their master's, or about to complete their master's degree or completed it. And in fact, we have a lot of are again, completing the process of completing all degrees. So again, these are folks that are, are looking for opportunities to give back. They're looking for opportunities to uh, test their skills in instructional, and they're using our MOOC as a means of doing that. One thing that we're um, hoping, and through efforts like this, to expand is our participation outside of North America. At the last two MOOCs that we had in 2016, the majority of the participants came from North America, most from the United States and a few from Canada. Um, and then, unfortunately, uh, we were a little sparse outside of the United States. And so again, hopefully in outreach like we're doing today, um, we can expand our reach and include um, more participation from outside the outside of North America. And just to give you a sense for why people joined our MOOC, um, I mean, we pulled back some snippets that we uh, conducted and that we received from a survey that we participants um, very much hear over and over that people to build their skills in instructional design. Uh, to meet current career needs and hopefully leading to better jobs and better promotions in the future. Um, again, uh, this idea of building their skills. And there's also um, something I think that really parallels with Emerge Africa is that um, we're, there's, there's the sense through the MOOC that we're building a community of volunteers. And uh, we have a LinkedIn group, for example, with it that has about 600 um, people that are interested in, in finding ways to leverage the relationships they're getting within the MOOC outside of that, maybe, find, you know, potentially finding better jobs or career promotions, things like that. And it looks like Tony has a question. Um, how many participants were there last time? Um, how massive is the MOOC? Yeah, the M is always an interesting uh, piece of the acronym, isn't it? Um, in in uh, the first MOOC we had, we had uh, 2,100 people, and the second MOOC we had about 1,300 people. And in our next MOOC in the spring, it's going to be a shorter duration and a focus on evaluation, so we're targeting about 600. So we certainly aren't in the category of some of the MOOCs that you hear that have tens of thousands of people. Um, and it, we're very hands-on within the MOOC. We have about um, a dozen facilitators in the past. Uh, 
who are also volunteering. And so we try to keep, um, keep it in a, a, still like a regular online class where you have the interaction among participants and the facilitators. And so, uh, again, we're not in that uh, tens of thousands, but it's, uh, it's still, I guess, a, a massive in, in the M sense <laughs> compared to a, a class of 20 or 30. So let's just spend a little bit of time drilling down on open educational resources. I'm assuming if you're on this uh, webinar, you're familiar with open educational resources, and we don't need to spend a lot of the time um, defining it. But we really do rely on this definition from the Hewlett Foundation. Um, and they, they were focusing on teaching and learning resources that reside in the public domain. In our case, we use Creative Commons to license our, um, our lessons that are developed by the MOOC participants. And um, we're, we're under that license, we're um, throwing the resources out into the world for others to use for free and to repurpose for their, within their own context. And I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on the next two slides, because this is really where I hope our conversation, our asynchronous conversation we have in our discussions, I hope we spend some time talking about this. Um, as uh, Nicola mentioned, um, when she first asked me to take part in this, we really are coming up on, a, on the 15-year anniversary of open educational resources as being a term that we use collectively within education to describe um, open educational resources and, and to describe the free um, and openly licensed materials. And so I wanted to take a moment to, to pause and look at what the original goals were and the vision was for open educational resources. And there's a link at the bottom of this page um, to an, a UNESCO document. In, in 2002, they, UNESCO convened a forum of invited participants from higher education across the world, as well as from some NGOs, to contemplate what could be and what, what, what we could create. And as part of those original goals um, laid out here on this screen, was this idea of open access. At the time, this was um, something that they were trying to align with open access in terms of open access software. And they were thinking, how can we take that concept and, and bring it into the education world in terms of sharing resources? Um, this idea of having prov provisions for adaptation, using available information and communication technologies to, uh, to support this initiative. Um, and this, I think, is really this fourth bullet point, this idea of targeting a diverse community of users. And this will really be something that John and I drill down at the second half of our session today, is this idea of localizing the resources that are created. How can we, how can something I create here in Chicago, Illinois, be of something of use and of interest to someone in Cape Town? And then certainly the last bullet point gets a lot of attention, this idea that it's non-commercial and uh, the resources are, are available for free. So again, as I mentioned, I've, I've posed a, a question within our asynchronous discussion forum within Emerge Africa around this idea. This was the vision 15 years ago. How are we doing in progress to achieving this vision? Um, and I think it'll be really interesting for all of us from our different perspectives, from where we sit in different places in the world, where we sit in different jobs and working with higher education or maybe K-12 or, you know, with working with kids. Um, it may be working, as I mentioned, what we're doing with adults who are trying to achieve their, um, their credentials. How are, how are we doing in achieving this vision? And then um, if, if, in terms of success and failure, um, I also posted a question in terms of challenges. Well, this is a very lofty goal that we have in terms of being able to offer these resources for free to those out in the world. It's not easy. And we certainly have run into a lot of challenges um, in putting together our MOOCs and putting together, uh, adapting resources that are already out there. And some of the, the things that, that had come out were highlighted in an article. And unfortunately, it's behind a paywall. But I do have the link there to an article from Wiley Bliss and McEwen um, that was published in uh, the handbook for uh, the AECT, the organization I mentioned early, earlier, the Association for Educational Communication and Technology. And they pre uh, prepared a nice overview, a nice literature review of open educational resources, the kind of the state of things. How, how are things going? And they've identified these as being really the biggest challenges that we have yet to overcome. 
this idea of localization that I just mentioned a moment ago. How can OER be used and designed and adapted in a wide range of contexts? And this is a really big deal. When we first started out in Designers for Learning, we thought we could just take available resources that were developed for children and then somehow make a few tweaks and then that would be applicable to teaching the same subject matter but to an adult educate, uh, an adult um, learner. So I guess I, using the example I used previously, say for example teaching fractions, one would just on the surface think, okay, we have lots of lessons on how to teach fractions to a, 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 you know, a, a nine-year-old. <laughs> Why can't we just take that material and present it to an adult and, uh, and have success? And unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Uh, for one thing, adults are put off when they're looking at resources designed for a child, uh, when they have graphics that are cartoons, uh, maybe a dancing cartoon going across the screen is very offensive to an adult who's very serious about their education and what they're trying to achieve. That's one example. Um, and then also these challenges associated with remixing. I talked a moment ago that we use Creative Commons as um, the, our vehicle to license our, um, our materials. However, if anyone spent any time looking at the Creative Commons licenses, it's not just one license. There are multiple licenses and not all of them play nice with each other. They don't all mix properly. And so that's one consideration that you have to, um, that we've run up against and, and is a big challenge. And also, you get into issues of pedagogical purposes and the context and the learner audience. Uh, I may develop a lesson that's wonderful for my learners in my context for my purposes. But if you pick up that resource, it's very likely you're going to have to make substantial changes to it in order for it to make sense for your learners and for your context and your purpose. Um, and then there's some just some very practical considerations. Uh, with, with sharing things with the world. Um, discovery. Um, how can this OER be put out in a place where people can find it? And then when you have that platform, how do you pay for it? Um, what's, the, what's the sustainability model? How will that program to support OER be financially self-sustaining? And then certainly the big question, and I think this, I'm finally probably, what, 20 minutes in here getting to the heart of uh, why Nicola <laughs> invited me here is to talk about quality. Um, and this certainly comes up a lot when people are saying, why would I use a free resource when I can go out and buy a textbook that I know is well vetted, it's been edited by uh, a publishing house, and um, so because it comes in a nice pretty book that's bound, it certainly has to be better than some free resource I find on the internet. And I'm here to tell you that's not necessarily the case. However, I can also tell you, yes, you're absolutely right. If you Google and go out and look for a resource on fractions, you'll find a lot of garbage that you would not want to use. And so that issue of quality and, and um, assessing quality as well as documenting it is, is very important. And so with that, I think I'm just going to take a quick pause. Um, John, is there anything that you'd like to just add to what I've said? Um, in terms of some of the, of the challenges that we facing, we're facing, and then also in terms of how we're addressing this. Well, we're going to be talking about it soon, the context part of it. Another thing that we as a group had to look at is um, understanding and having resources for subject matter experts. Um, so a group that started this were instructional designers, but we didn't necessarily have experience in adult basic education. And it was getting together with subject matter experts that could begin to help us um, look at the points that are on the screen right now as it relates to localization and, um, and remixing and, and quality. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but, but that's where bringing in more people and actually having a, a bigger team come together really benefited us to start addressing some of the um, challenges that uh, we have on the screen right now. Yeah. And please, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, if you have questions about our project or what I'm talking about, please um, take a moment to, um, to type it in the text chat and we'll, we'll do our best to address it. So I wanted to go through those bullet points that were on the previous slide one at a time 
and uh, really is now start drilling down on the issue and then also give you some examples of how we address these challenges. So as a, on the first, on the prior slide, the first bullet point was localization and remixing. So how can OER be designed, adapted, and shared to be useful with a wide range of learners and contexts? Um, and what I this is a lot of times when people think about open educational resources, they think about the no cost element, the free part of it. But really, if, if, if done correctly, when you develop an open educational resource, it really should include all of the boxes that are on the right hand side of the screen to make it truly open. It should be licensed so that it's available for people to remix it, revise it, reuse it, retain it, and then redistribute it. And those provisions really are at the heart of the Creative Commons licenses. And as I mentioned, it's not just one license. Depending on which license you choose, you can affect whether people are able to do those things. You can make it actually so restrictive that people can't do some of those things that are on the right. And so that's really important. We use the most uh, open license um, for Creative Commons, and I'll share with you in a moment which license that is uh, with this in mind. And also um, on this, in this regard, it's not just the license. It's also how you develop the resource. If you develop the resource on a very proprietary system, um, a lockdown piece of software that someone can't or, um, change, for example, even if you put the resource out in a PDF, you know, a, a PDF file versus a, an editable file such as a Word document or a PowerPoint or something like that, even that decision that you made to put it out as a PDF is going to in some way limit a person's ability down the road to revise it. They may have to retype it. They may have to do you know, cutting and pasting. And, and, and just that decision on which technology you use can, can affect that. So we try to keep everything as open a tool when we're using it. And we're going to talk in a moment about the specific tools we use. But this really comes up, I think, very much in, this, in the context of localization and being able to remix. And here's the license we use. We we use the Attribution 4.0 International License for Creative Commons, and we certainly don't have enough time now today to go through the, the nuts and bolts of this license, but if you head over to the Creative Commons website, if you're not familiar, it's, the, uh, it's basically um, an, all, all, the only thing we're requesting in this is that you give us proper at attribution, that we were the ones that created the resource. Beyond that, you're free to do just about anything else you want to do with it. You can just even sell it commercially. You can uh, remix it in any way you want. And this gets at the heart of that prior slide that showed those boxes on the right. By, by, by us putting our resources out there with this most liberal license, we're hopefully allowing others the best chance to be able to remix and use this in their location. And then, John, I wondered if you could just spend a couple uh, minutes on this slide. We spend a lot of time within our, our MOOC in, in, from our instructional design perspective, thinking about the learners who will be resources. And I think for a person who's going and finding a resource, you have to understand that the resource that was created was created for a different learner audience. And you're going to have to spend some degree of time figuring out, OK, how would this resource I need to change it in order for it to be applicable to my set of learners. So John, would you mind just spending a couple minutes talking to, to us about how we've come to the personas that we're using in our, in our course? Absolutely. One of the things as we were designing this MOOC is that we, we are getting an understanding that someone that needs better math skills, that may be deficient in math skills, um, that doesn't mean that their, de their deficiency really has to be towards real life experiences, experiences. So for instance, if you have a sixth grade math skill here in the United States, um, what does that mean as an adult? Well, that may mean that you aren't going to be able to balance a checkbook. That may mean that you're not going to be able to um, take care of a monthly household budget. So all of the learning experiences were going to be geared towards being real life. So with that in mind, we wanted the designers to put themselves in their learner's shoes. And it's really called empathic design. Having empathy is 
Kentucky. We did a lot of research working with subject matters. Um, they had input on this. They had done a survey for us. And we began to develop these six different personas. And persona is a fictitious representation of a learner. But even though it's fictitious, it's based off of data. So personas need to be authentic, and they also need to be engaging. So the designer engages with the persona and says, oh, yes, I can connect with that person. And by me being able to connect with that person, able then to connect, immerse myself with them, and then step and say, how can I help that person? So we created these six personas. And these six personas represented adults that are looking to um, get their high school, high school equivalency um, exam completed in the United States. So we had Jeff, Crystal, Jamie, Ann, Malcolm, Mary, and Robert. Each one of them had a different context. Jeff was from the Midwest the United States, which which is a lot of land. Um, um, Crystal was more from an urban area. Robert, believe it or not, um, was um, in jail. And in the United States, um, there's this whole area where prisons and jails are now creating these opportunities for those that are incarcerated to, to learn and be able to work towards getting um, a a high school equivalency um, diploma. So Robert represented somebody that was incarcerated. And using these personas, we had the designers throughout the MOOC continuously check back as they were designing. And they helped the personas create the context, but then they also helped the focus and kept the designers thinking about who am I designing to? Who am I designing to? Because our designers were coming from different contexts. Some designers were already adult basic educators who are, are working with adults but in the farmland of the United States. Those learners have different needs and there's different challenges that they have. So that really is what we were working with and we saw and, and, and this is a research interest of mine, we saw that the designers used these personas throughout the um, design of their learning experiences. And we also saw it very deep into designing them, which was really an interesting finding that it's in, in, the, in the brainstorming part of their design at the beginning, you know, you would expect them to say, okay, who's my learner, who's my learner? But as they continue to refine their learning experiences and they continue to get feedback from um, other people in a formative evaluation setting, they continuously went back to their learners and, and were calling out, well, I'm, I'm, I'm designing for Mary. And would Mary be able to get something out of this learning experience? So creating this context, creating this, this empathetic design situation where the learners could put themselves in their learner's shoes really helped for this whole concept of localization. And as I mentioned, our next MOOC is going to be an evaluation MOOC, and we're carrying this concept on to that. So when the um, MOOC participant is uh, finding an, a resource, we're asking them to go back to the resources that have been previously created, and then either create SONA uh, again, if we're talking about someone outside of these six uh, personas we've created, if it's in a different context and you would like to adapt the lesson, consider your persona, or consider, the, I'm sorry, consider the resource in light of the persona. And I think this is really important for anyone who's going out and looking at a resource. I really, I'm kind of harping on the point here, but I, I think it really is important to, to, to know that the resources very rarely can just be taken at face value and just hand it off to a, to a learner. There needs to be some process where you consider your audience. And Tony mentioned, um, you know, is this similar to human-centered design? And I think it does in that 
it's, it's very learner-centered. It's this idea that um, the, you know, the, 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 the essence of a lesson, a lesson of in, essence of instruction starts with the learner. And until you have your head around uh, from the design perspective and the designer, who your learner is, um, that this process, I think, does need to happen. Someone else mentioned that they had not really thought of this in the context of working with OER. Um, but I, I, I think it really is um, is something that we're going to be at least testing in our MOOC, and uh, we've certainly done research on in the design phase that we feel it's a very important part of the design process. Um, discovery and sustainability. Um, well, we've been very, very fortunate to uh, partner with OER, they've been a huge supporter of our work, they've attended conferences with us, they've been, um, been part of some of our um, sessions we've had. They're a very amazing organization. If you haven't gone to the OER Commons website to see what they have to offer or in ways that you can potentially build out your OER um, and initiatives, it's a great place to start. Um, so it's at oercommons.org. And so we use this platform to not only house the resources that we create, but to also find resources that others have, um, have, have put out into the universe and find ways to adapt. So let's just drill down on this a little bit. So to create the resource, they have a, a, an authoring tool called Open Author. It's free to use. And this really helped us in terms of our sustainability. We originally were thinking, OK, do, should we you know, kind of the whole um, the make or bill, uh, or, I'm sorry, make or buy decision. And so our decision was not to, to make our own platform or to make our own uh, authoring tools. We decided to use the resources that are available for free, which has its pros and its cons. Uh, certainly the pro is that it's free and it's a very sustainable and very uh, stable platform but it's not very customizable. It, you kind of take what they, they offer. And fortunately, the tools are very, very good. But when we were first making the decision on whether to go with OER Commons, there are limitations when you use perfect for you. But it, it really does at least 80% of our needs. And hopefully down the road, we can work with them to tweak it for the 20%. For example, uh, their site is very much geared toward higher education and um, K-12 education working with children. And so they don't have a niche really carved out for this adult basic education. Um, so that come, we, we run up against that every once in a while when we're asked, for example, to, uh, to t tag a resource for a certain learner group. We don't have the ability to tag it for adult, um, look, you know, adult basic education. So one of the tools that um, they offer is Open Author. And I highly recommend at least going onto their site and playing around with it. If you're looking for a way like Google Docs, it's very easy to use, very user friendly, and it allows you to um, embed, for example, a YouTube video or another type of document or an image, and uh, also add your own text. So that's how we create the resource. And then um, back on this prior, um, it's, it's also the way that once once the resource is created, it's stored on OER Commons within a group that, that we have specific to our, our project. And then anyone who comes to the site, when they search for resources, they could then very quickly, uh, by putting in the search terms, find the resources we created, um, again, assuming that they put in the, the appropriate search criteria. Now, in terms of quality, this, again, is that million-dollar uh, question. How can we design, evaluate, rank, and document OER quality? And we'll, sh we'll share with you some of the things that we're doing on our end. And hopefully, these are things that um, you can take back to your practice as well. We really, everything we do is built on this, these sound instructional design processes and, and principles. And so this is a very basic design model. It's, it's not. Addy, I'm sure some folks on this uh, um, webinar have, have heard the term Addy. It's, it's even more uh, generic, I guess you could say, um, of a process model than, than that. But in, in a nutshell, what we really tried to have our instructional designers do is to analyze the situation, analyze the context, the learner, as John mentioned, the personas, um, go through and synthesize all of the opportunities and constraints of what they are, what they're designing. So um, will these resources be used in a face-to-face -face setting? Will they be used 
in an online setting. And then we go through a, a basic design cycle where we have the designers simulate um, uh, the resource in some type of draft prototype that goes through an evaluation process and then finally um, decisions are made based on that evaluation on what the lesson will ultimately look like. And so this is the process we use. Now that, and that it was really what we used in the last two MOOCs, which was we went through a full design process like this. Now in this uh, MOOC that we're uh, offering in, starting in March, the evaluation mark, um, MOOC, we're starting at the evaluation phase. And so we're asking folks to go out and take one of the resources that's been previously developed and evaluate it on a set of criteria beginning with um, the first principles of instruction. Now this is Meryl, I'm not sure how many um, that are joining us now are familiar, but it's Meryl's first principles of instruction and it's a very, at a high level, it's what a lesson and instruction should in some way uh, contain to be, have your best shot of it being a successful learning opportunity. So all of our lessons begin with this, within the context of having a real world problem or task. Um, there's uh, opportunities for the learner to um, activate their prior knowledge on the topic. Um, there's uh, examples of through demonstration and practice uh, opportunities with application and then finally integration. And so we don't have time right now to go through all the steps of the first principles of instruction, but this is really what is at the heart of all the lessons that we create and also now in the evaluation we'll be focusing very much on whether or not to what extent does the lesson that they're evaluating align with these first principles principles of instruction. And then all of our lessons that we create, the OER has a, a I don't want to say a template because that sounds like it's too rigid, but we do ask all the designers to make sure their lessons have a warm-up activity, some type of introduction to the topic, presentation, a practice opportunity, um, in some way that the learner has an assessment or an evaluation to the extent that they're able to um, assess their mastery, how, how they mastered the topic that's that's being covered, and then finally a way to apply that in the real world. So that we, we really try to make sure all of our lessons have that, all with this idea of quality in, our, um, in, in the back of our mind. And then also within OER Commons, one of the things that uh, drew us to the site is you, we do have the opportunity for crowdsourcing of evaluation. So if you look on the screen, it's in tiny writing, you may not be able to read it. Uh, but there is a button that um, the, the public, you for example, could go on and look at one of our resources right now and click the evaluate button and it will take you to what are called the achieve rubrics and you can go through and evaluate the resource based on the uh, criteria set up within the re achieve rubric. And this example, I think Janet's on our call right now, this is an example of a resource that was created by Janet Lee, who's actually on the web conference right now. And so uh, at this point, it looks like 81 people have found her resource, it, um, seven people have tagged it since she created it, and then um, it looks like a, at least one user has gone through and provided an evaluation of it. And um, so I think that's kind of that full circle idea that you have got a designer out there creating it and then you have the ability for others to step in and offer their perspective in terms of the evaluation. Jan, it still needs work. <laughs> it's very humble, very humble. So that really concludes our comments um, that we wanted to make and we're, we, we just like to use the next uh, 10, 15 minutes to answer any questions that people may have and, and certainly to promote and hopefully entice you to join us in our MOOC and uh, I guess I'll just ask, go out right ahead and ask the question, uh, is anyone on our call right now interested in joining the MOOC or is this something that you could see yourself recommending to your students um, if you teach in an education setting that they may be interested in joining us? And John too, if you have any other questions, I, we kind of concluded there without you giving any last thoughts, anything else in terms of our project or anything you wanted to add, please feel free to add it. Oh cool, I'm reading some of the comments here. So Jerome is mentioning, um, yeah, designing with the learners in mind, yeah, categorize. The, that's really interesting. Jerome, if you could drill down on that for us, Jerome is mentioning that um, they categorize the learners and at, use it as a guide. I'd be really interested to see what that process is like and, and how, and John and I have certainly had discussions on how formal that process needs to be 
in terms of um, analyzing learners and, and trying to assess some type of persona. Oh, and Jerome's asking, is it possible to do this kind of design without t uh, teamwork? If one were to do so, what would the chances of a design would be standard? Let's see. I think there might be more to the question that's ahead of it. Yeah, and just to clarify, I think I'm getting um, the, the gist of the question. We, the design of the work that we're doing within our MOOC, either you can work individually or you can work on a team, but I think what you're getting at is um, Oh, it's not it's just a challenge. It is. I see what you're saying. It's not just a challenge to assemble a team. John, do you have any thoughts on that? as far as the team concept? I know, you know, in our case, it was very, very helpful to have the team, um, you know, working with us. Um, I think that, I believe that it could be done without a team. I just think that the team was, you know, beneficial for us. And, and if you can get yourself in a position where you can have um, other resources assisting. You know, I, I can't say enough about how the subject matter experts assisted us in really understanding what is happening to um, the population of the United States of these, you know, 700 million people that don't have um, the, um, you know, the, the education, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and Jerome, I think, um, just to tie on what John was saying, I think the, the most crucial part of a quote, and I'm putting in air quotes so you can't see, of a team is the subject matter experts. While those of us, John and myself and the other designers on the team, had expertise in instructional design, we did not have expertise in terms of the learner audience and the context. And so we would not have done very well had we not included those subject matter experts as part of our team. So I think at some level, I'm, maybe not in terms of how large your team is, but more in terms of what uh, ex expertise and what background they bring. As long as the people that are on your team are very well versed in the learner audience and the context, I think that's important. So certainly, as you're saying, sometimes you as a designer may be the subject matter expert if it's something you're aware of. But if it is something outside, a learner population that you're not familiar with or a context that you're not familiar with, then it really is crucial, as John said, to bring in members from the team that have expertise in that. Yeah, and uh, Nicola, uh, you asked a great question to kind of tag teaming on that idea. Can people who are, who are not subject matter experts create OERs? Most certainly, and in fact, I think, going back to this idea of team, it's a great teamwork to have a person who's an experienced or a trained instructional designer work with a subject matter expert. Um, and I think I unfortunately attended classes that were designed by subject matter experts who weren't instructional designers. And that doesn't often work well. They may be very well versed in the subject matter, but don't have, um, going back to that idea of Merrill's first principles of instruction, it tends to be what I term shovelware, where they give you a whole bunch of subject matter uh, content, but it's not embedded in an experience um, that's very much geared toward the learner. Uh, so thank you, think Okay. So if the content expert is also a subject matter expert with that work, that would be the best case scenario, Jerome. I mean, that would be wonderful that, um, that you have both those people. Um, oftentimes you don't. And, and that was just our, our specific situation in tackling this type of service move is that these instructional designers that we brought together to actually design the MOOC and lead people through the different module to get to a learning experience. We just didn't have that subject matter expert on this particular topic. 
But again, if you have that combination, that's wonderful because um, that really, really puts you in an advantageous position to develop very effective learning experiences. Yeah, and, and uh, Jerome's follow-up uh, point here, it's great to have the second set of eyes, and as John said, we had subject matter experts in adult basic education, but very often we did not have a subject matter expert, for example, in math or in um, some type of English language arts topic, and so that's another layer to the expertise that's required is, um, is having someone on the team that may have the subject matter expertise from, from the, the to be learned material, not necessarily about the learners. And I wanted to um, address also Vicki's question, great question, and I think I'm getting uh, the understanding of the question. Can participants or potential participants' feedback on the OIRs be used for it to evaluate quality? Absolutely, huge missing piece of what we're doing. At this point, we have not tested our resources with actual learners, um, and so that definitely um, is a missing piece of what we're doing and should happen. We just aren't quite there yet. We don't feel our resources have gone through sufficient vetting and evaluation from a formative evaluation standpoint to be put out, <laughs> to, I guess, to, to, to kind of waste the time of our learners. But that's our, definitely our next step is to um, have learners, actual learners, adult learners, sit down, is it usable, is it um, efficient, is it effective for them to be able to use it, and is it appealing? Um, those types of questions that you would ask within a, that type of evaluation will definitely be something we work on in the future. Um, let's see, uh, Nicola's asking, how does one decide on criteria to evaluate quality? So what we're using, and certainly there are lots of ways to evaluate quality, there are lots of evaluation rubrics out there. What we're relying on is very much going back to the drawing board in terms of what did we use as our measures and metrics for quality when we designed, uh, using that uh, Merrill's first principles of instruction, and then we're also layering in some other things such as um, um, some affective considerations, which gets into appeal, usability, um, efficiency, things like that we're also layering in within the MOOC. Um, but we're really relying pretty heavily on the same types of criteria we used when we designed the MOOC um, as what we're using as our evaluation criteria. And as John mentioned, yeah, there are various ways of, of arriving at such criteria. We, in fact, John and I have had some pretty long conversations um, with, we had some offers to work with us to have very elaborate rubrics <laughs> that, that would be evaluated, and it's probably beyond the scope of our project to be able to go as far as some folks had requested that we go or suggested we go. Um, so Tony's been asking about the incentives that attract volunteers. It's been so interesting. How do we pull volunteers? Um, we started out, we had a very small distribution list of probably about 300 people, very much tied to AECT, so again, the Association of Communication, uh, Educational Communication and Technology. Right now, our distribution list is 6,000, so as soon as we got our something that you, people could participate uh, to our website, and we have it, uh, probably every day three to five people reach out to us and say, instructional design program, it's been a great program, however, I don't have the, I've never had the opportunity to test my skills in a real life context. And, um, and that's really what the, the niche, the, the piece of the puzzle that we were able to offer. And so through word of mouth, we've been able to, through faculty and through students telling each other about our opportunities, um, get the word out. And, and again, in about two years, we've gone from 300 contacts context to over 6,000. Yeah, we did, see, did, Tony, you mentioned wild expansion. We agree. <laughs> we're, we're pretty blown away. And when we when, when we put out, put out our first call for our MOOC, I think, John, what was our, our first target? In the hundreds, we thought maybe we'd get 600, we thought was kind of a wild number, and we ended up getting 2,100 people signing up for our first MOOC. So we were pretty surprised as well. And Janet's mentioning, she's a perfect example. Janet was in a master's degree program at um, University of Tampa when she found out about us and um, 
she's been great. She went from being a student participant to the last two um, MOOCs. She's now going to be a facilitator helping us facilitate the experience. And um, as Nicola's mentioning, it's a great segue to our asynchronous discussion. Um, I, I've put a couple of question prompts up, but certainly if there's something else within the forum, and Nicola put the link in there uh, into the chat room for where you can find our asynchronous discussion. But I think this will be great to, to continue the conversation all week. Oh, indeed. Thanks so much, Jen and John. That was absolutely amazing. And you know, as Jen said, here's the link to the forum. And if these issues really intrigue you, we totally encourage you to sign up for the MOOC. Um, it's on the designersforlearning.org website. You'll find a link to the, it's called Evaluation MOOC. And just again from Emerge Africa, thank you so much to Jen Madrill and John Barkey for today's webinar on evaluating and revising OERs. Just a quick also just to, to tell folks that today, I forgot to mention it earlier, this event, <coughs> excuse me, is a part of a, on the global calendar for um, the year of open events. And you can find stacks of events on that calendar. Here's the link. Because we're actually celebrating many really important milestones this year, uh, and the Open Education Consortium, uh, you know, started the la launched the year of Open to celebrate the positive impacts that open practices have, have had uh, in the fields of education, government, research, um, and business. And milestones for the open education movement worldwide, you know, would you have? thought that the term open educational resources was created 15 years ago. Um, and the first open education week and the first OER World Congress took place five years ago. So many interesting milestones. Uh, so, And you can also follow them on Facebook. They've got a Facebook page if you just look up here of open. And also why not join the Designers for Learning community? Going to add their website again. Any last words, Jen and John or Jakob? I just want to thank you very much for the opportunity. As I said, we're very North America centric right now in our projects, and we're so excited to have the opportunity to expand our, our reach and include everyone who's listening to my voice right now. Yep. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to speak um, with you and the comment were wonderful. Thank you.